Welcome to the Champs App Podcast, where we help players and parents demystify the world of minor hockey development and recruiting for both girls and boys. On this episode, I talk with David Stockdale, who is the head coach of the Franklin Pierce women's hockey team. We discuss his non-traditional coaching path, go in-depth on the Ravens hockey program, and he shares his perspective on the upcoming recruiting season. I really enjoyed my conversation with David, and I hope you do too. Before we start the podcast, I want to let you know about the app in Champs App. Champs App lets you create a free, beautiful online hockey resume to share with coaches, teams, and players. Your profile includes all the information coaches want to know to help decide if you are a player they want to keep on their recruiting radar. What makes Champs App unique is that you can then connect directly with college, prep, or team coaches, and they can then follow your updates. So when you add a new highlight video or a game to your schedule, coaches will automatically get notified of these changes to your profile. It's a really easy way to keep all your connections up to date. Check out the links in the show notes to see a list of some of the college coaches already using Champs app. And stay tuned after the episode for more details on how easy it is to create your Champs app hockey resume. I'd like to welcome to the podcast, David Stockdale, who is the head coach of the Franklin Pierce Ravens women's hockey program. Originally from the Washington, D.C. area, David attended college at the University of New Hampshire. He then started his coaching career in 2003 with the University of Maine. Then he moved on to Division III with Southern Maine Huskies, followed by Castleton State and Chatham University, and then moved to Division I back with the University of Maine as an assistant coach. After that, he was hired to start the women's hockey program at Franklin Pierce. During his 10 seasons as the program's only coach, he has won over 160 games, and this year the team won the Newha Championship, and David was named Coach of the Year for the conference. Welcome to the podcast, David. Thanks, Ray. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. That's a, that's a lot of stuff, so we're going to go through a lot about your <laughs> coaching uh, career uh, as we discuss on this podcast, but why don't we start where it all began with you uh, getting your love for the game of hockey and um, you, know, you playing hockey as a kid and uh, eventually moving into the coaching ranks. Yeah, um, it's probably one of the, the least exciting stories of the people you've talked to. Um, you know, nothing really fancy. I grew up in the Washington, D.C. area, DC area um, in northern Virginia, mid-80s. Um, not exactly a hockey hotbed. Uh, and so, you know, at the time, there wasn't a whole lot of hockey in that area. And I just, you know, I was very fortunate. I, I happened to see a game on TV, said it was something that I was interested in. My mom signed me up for skating lessons and, and I loved it. And I, and I played and, and, you know, I was the only kid in the neighborhood that played all the teams I played on. We had kids from, you know, Maryland and Pennsylvania, because you couldn't put a team together, of kids from where I was from. So uh, it was, uh, I guess, I guess growing up at that time, guys like Rod Langway and Peter Bondra and Craig Laughlin just didn't have the appeal that, you know, Ovechkin has now. So, so hockey in that area has come such a long way, which is, is awesome. I'm a little jealous that I didn't get to kind of grow up in that area and be part of that, uh, in that era. Uh, but, um, you know, it was just something that kind of happened by chance. I, I didn't have family that played. I didn't have, you know, friends that played. I didn't have siblings that played. Um, just happened to kind of find it and, and get started at the, you know, the learn to skate and, spent a lot of time out in the driveway shooting pucks and just kind of fell in love organically with it that way. And uh, what levels of youth hockey did you play as you were growing up and how far did you take it? Uh, I mean, I played all the way up until I went to college. Um, you know, so I played through Bantams and Midgets and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, kind of funny. So I played, uh, uh, not all of the time, but I played many years with the Washington Little Capitals. Uh, and I don't know, have you had Kush on the on the podcast? I have not. The Washington Pride. Uh, so a very you know, important probably person in, in women's hockey in the Washington, D.C. area. And at the time, he was coaching the girls team for the Washington Little Capitals. So I remember being a, a peewee in a Bantam and sharing the ice with his teams. And, you know, he would put us through the paces at the beginning of practice and that kind of stuff. And, you know, here we are 30 years later and, and you know, he's still coaching the girls and, and I'm doing this and we're collaborating on recruits and things like that. So, um, you know, I, I guess, you know, it's just one of those things where, you know, I look back now and it's 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 pretty neat to kind of see where 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 it was where it's come from how it's influenced me and and um, you know kind of led me into my coaching career and um, where was your mindset around potentially playing college hockey did you know like right away that you know that wasn't in the in the cards or do you think like hey maybe I got a shot maybe I could walk on out of school uh, honestly I had no idea how any of it worked um, I never you know, I had some coaches that were good coaches and that I really enjoyed, but I don't think any of them had played at this level either. Uh, and, and so I had no concept of the fact that, 
you know, a lot of, a lot of coaches or a lot of players going to college were 20, 21 years old as freshmen. I just thought you played and, you know, I got some letters from some junior teams and stuff like that, but again, I just didn't really understand how it all worked. And so I thought when you were 18, you went to college and I didn't have opportunities at 18 to play college hockey because I wasn't, you know, that level of player and I, I just didn't know any better. So, you know, I went off to school and, and, you know, did four years at school at UNH and had a great time. And I went to a lot of hockey games and really loved it. And, and honestly, I probably, having that break from playing is probably what led me back uh, to coaching. Uh, and if I had, you know, played all through college and, and you know, maybe beyond that, maybe I would have, maybe I wouldn't have come back and done what I ended up doing uh, as a coach. So uh, it's one of those things, like, I, I certainly don't regret it. I think it's part of the reason, again, that I, that I got to where I am today. Um, and maybe just having that that time off and that break really kind of led me back to it. Gotcha. Okay. Um, one more youth hockey question, which is looking back at at the entirety of your youth hockey playing days. You know, what was your favorite youth hockey memory? Uh, I mean, there's a lot of them. Obviously, um, you know, I, I I think now maybe if you'd asked me this when I was younger, it would have been you know some of the games that you get to play in, like you know going to nationals and and winning games at nationals, we got to do that. Um, going to the Quebec Pee Wee tournament, you know, those kind of things that are, were a big deal as a player. I think as you get older, you, you also appreciate, like I was saying before, you know, my, my team was made up of kids from Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania. You know, our closest games were, you know, four or five hours away. So every weekend, you know, piling in the car with my parents, I probably didn't love it at the time, but I look back now and just, you know, getting to spend that time with them and, and, um, you know, all the traveling and the things that we got to do together and, you know, them coming to all my games and being really supportive. And, you know, you just, you look back and you really appreciate those things, maybe a little bit more as you get older. Gotcha. And, and who's your favorite hockey player growing up? Uh, growing up, Steve Eiserman definitely was my favorite. Um, you know, I, I wasn't necessarily a Red Wings fan. I've always been a Capitals fan. Uh, but Steve Eiserman was just, he was the man, like he was a great player. He was a great leader. Um, obviously was a really prolific offensive player. And then as he got older and injuries kind of, you know, came in and, and all that kind of stuff, like he, he completely transformed his game, became more of a two-way guy. And uh, I just thought he was sort of the ultimate hockey player. And did you wear number 19? Uh, to, to For a few to years, I did. Yeah, for a few years. Definitely. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. All right. Let's, let's, let's move on to coaching. So like, at what point did the light bulb go on saying, hey, I'd like to try Coaching hockey, um, whether it was youth, youth or girls or whatever age group, like what, when did the light bulb go on and say, hey, like I'm going to get out on the ice and try and help some other, some kids uh, become yeah. better hockey players? So like I said, when I was at UNH, uh, you know, I still went to a lot of hockey games. My roommate was the photographer for the athletic department. So uh, all the men's hockey games, a lot of the women's hockey games, especially at home, you know, I was at every game and, and just watching a lot of hockey. So I was still around it. And as I got on towards graduation, you know, senior year, you're sitting there, you're trying to figure out what, you know, what am I going to do when I graduate in a few months? And I'd gone to all these hockey games. I'd gotten to know a lot of the parents of the players really well um, on both sides, the men's and the women's side. Uh, but at that time in the early 2000s, like I would go to the games and it was like, you know, there's a lot of talent. There's a lot of good players, but I just didn't feel like the organization of the game was there. Like the players, you know, in terms of systems and that sort of stuff, it was just very disjointed. And I felt like, maybe I could contribute. I felt like I understood the game really well. I felt like maybe there was an opportunity for me to, to help. And, and so I knew I wanted to coach. I knew I wanted to get involved. I felt like the women's side was an opportunity to get involved at a high level right away. At that point in time, you didn't have, you know, people coming over from the men's side and, and nobody was doing that. Uh, and so I just felt like there was an opportunity. I knew I wanted to coach higher level athletes. And I thought there was a real, you know, potential for a door to walk through uh, with the women's hockey side. So as I was getting closer to graduation, I sent a letter to every single uh, head coach, division one, division three, said, listen, you know, I, I'm lucky. I've got a supportive family. Like I'll work for free. I just want to get my foot in the door, um, you know, get an opportunity. And there were six or eight coaches that got back to me and, you know, gave me an opportunity. And, you know, some of them I'm still coaching against today, which is, is kind of neat. Um, you know, but there were a bunch of them that brought me in and gave me an opportunity. And, and ultimately, you know, I was able to, to get an opportunity to go to, uh, to the University of Maine and work with Rick Filigera. Uh, and that kind of started everything. 
Wow. So there's a lesson in there about, uh, hey, just uh, you, you just say you want to help people out and volunteer and uh, you, uh, you send out enough messages, uh, whether it's a uh, probably snail mail back then or, uh, you know, email these days. Uh, okay. Hey, you can create opportunity for yourself. All right. So, so tell us about that first experience at the University of Maine back in 2003. Uh, yeah, well, the reason, you know, like I said, I interviewed and went and met with a bunch of coaches. Um, Peter Van Buskirk was at Holy Cross at the time. Tom O'Malley from Sacred Hearts. Uh, Bob Duraney was at Providence. Uh, that was a few of the ones that I had gone and met with. And, uh, and then Rick Filigera actually invited me to come up and work uh, their camp. So I was like, hey, this is a great situation. I can go get a basically a week-long interview, make a little bit of money, um, you know, and, and spend some time with them and kind of see what they're all about. And, you know, we hit it off really well, uh, got along with him. Uh, he was a great guy. And, and um, you know, he, he offered me an opportunity. And what was intriguing to me about that opportunity was at the time, University of Maine only had one full-time assistant coach. So even as a volunteer, I was able to essentially step into a, a full assistant coach role and go recruiting and do some of those things that typically a volunteer coach is not able to do. Um, so it was, for me, it was an opportunity to kind of have my hands you know, more in the mix of everything that was going on and get a little bit more experience. And, and ultimately that was uh, a big reason that I decided to go to the University of Maine. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So I'm really curious. So you, you didn't play, you know, uh, division one hockey. You're now coaching or uh, helping coach division one women's hockey. Yeah. Um, how did your hockey skill level and what you knew about hockey compared to the women at that time obviously you know almost 20 years ago very different state of the game than it is today sure, but yeah. you know um you know where do you felt that you added the most value and where did you feel like hey like these are some areas i still really need to work on that obviously you probably filled in over the last 20 years yeah, i mean like obviously i i wasn't a division one hockey player i wasn't a professional hockey player but i was a, i was a decent hockey player you know i was confident enough in my ability to get on the ice and and teach skills and show skills and you know it's not a situation where I'm you know getting around the wall at practice and holding on to the boards because I couldn't skate you know so I, I was I was comfortable getting out there and interacting with the players and I think that was a big part of you know me coming and working the camp too was an opportunity for them to see you know is does this guy know what he's doing too so you know so going and working that camp at Maine I think was a good thing for both sides because it gave them an opportunity to feel me out and I got to kind of get out there and show that you know, like I'd worked some camps and, and stuff as a, as a high school student, like I'd had some basics, uh, you know, doing some of that stuff with younger kids. I was always a fairly cerebral player. Um, you know, I was a fairly offensively gifted player. I, I, you know, never really had anyone teach me how to play defense and I was not a great skater, um, you know, although I was, you know, good enough to, to kind of get to where I got to. But uh, I, I think it's just one of those things where, you know, again, I, I was confident enough in my abilities to know that, you know, this was a level that I felt like I could get out there. Obviously, I was going to have things to learn, um, and I was going to pick up things along the way, but I, I just felt like in my heart, you know, there were things that I could teach to those players before I ever got to that level, uh, and, and so I did everything I could once I got there to kind of jump in and, and try to do that. Gotcha. And what what was the key to you um, to your overall coaching development over the the first you know six or seven years uh, that that you were coaching? Obviously, you had multiple stops at uh, several Division three schools, and then obviously you went back to the University of Maine. Um, but what was the key to your development during that period of time to really get to that high level of head coach capability? I think a lot of it is just you got to know that there's a lot of things that you don't know, and you know one of the one of the nice things about having a bunch of different stops, you get to work with different people for better or worse. Uh, and you pick up things from everybody, things that work, things that don't work. Um, and, and I tried to do that everywhere that I went, every opportunity, every good game, every bad game, every coaching stop, every practice was an opportunity to learn something, uh, whether from a head coach or an assistant coach that I worked with or from a player even. Um, I, I just have always loved hockey. So I, I watch hockey all the time. Uh, and, and I just, you know, when I go to games, like I, I'm not, if I go to a Capitals game, like I'm not sitting there cheering, like I'm watching the game and I'm watching little things and, you know, how, how plays develop and how the different systems work. And I've always just kind of looked at hockey through that lens. Uh, and, and so I think, you know, having the opportunity to learn from all these different people was really important for me. Uh, and, you know, it would have been great to go to, to one place and stay there for 20 years, but I might not have got the same experience if, if I had done that. Okay. And um, obviously we talked about you having multiple stops along the way. I'm curious if you ever considered moving over to the men's side or you def or did you have a preference to stay on the women's side um, and, and continue down that path? 
So I actually had an opportunity to do that um, a couple of years into my career here. Uh, and I decided that, you know, I definitely wanted to stay on the women's side. I just felt like, uh, you know, getting in on this level and, and working with these athletes and, and especially seeing the growth over the last 15, 20 years, like it's been awesome to be part of that. And, and to know that, you know, I got in kind of early on in the process, certainly, you know, not an original adopter, but I was pretty early on. And, and so to see where it's gone over the last 20 years, like that's something that I'm really excited about. And so, you know, for me, I, I don't see myself ever, ever moving over to the other side. Um, I just like working with these athletes too much. I think they work so hard and, and they're so receptive to teaching and coaching. Uh, you know, they, again, I think a lot of time, not, not in every case, there's obviously some kids that grow up with unbelievable coaching, but there's also, there's still kids that kind of grew up like I did, you know, and they had a, a well-meaning father that maybe never played himself as a, as a coach. And, and maybe they didn't learn about systems or they didn't learn about, you know, some of the skill development. So to be able to bring those players in and, and really teach them and see them blossom and grow uh, as athletes and as, as hockey players and obviously the off ice stuff too. But um, you know, that to me is, is really exciting. And I just think they, they have such an open mind to, to learning and um, they're so receptive to the coaching and the teaching that you give them. Awesome. All right. So we're going to get to Franklin Pierce in just a moment, but related to what you just said, um, how have players changed? How has the girls game or the women's game changed over the last 20 years? Like what, what, what did you see back then versus what you see now? Uh, the game now is just so much faster and, and more skilled. Um, you know, there's still players that take over games, but I think it's fewer and farther between. I, I top to bottom now, the rosters are, you know, so much deeper uh, and the teams are just so much more talented and, I think you see, like, you go back and watch, you know, the Olympics in the in the late 90s, and then you watch it today, like, the level that these women play at, it's unbelievable. And, um, you know, obviously there's more opportunities post-college now, and, and, you know, hopefully we can get, you know, one, one great league going for the women. But, you know, they have these opportunities to continue playing. And I think just, you know, seeing where they're at when they get to college, where they go once they leave college and, and the level um, – it's just, it's, it's really gratifying to see uh, that growth over the last 20 years. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. One last question before Franklin Pierce, looking back at the multiple stops that you had on your coaching career, since we can't go into each one of them, either which one was your favorite spot that you uh, had or any favorite memory you have from, from one of those uh, uh, teams that you coached? Um, well, I mean, certainly I love where I am right now. Uh, I think the opportunity to build something from scratch uh, really is a special opportunity. So getting to do that, um, you know, with our team at the Division Three level was was really awesome, and then having the the sort of new challenge of elevating the program to the Division One level. Um, so in, in a way, kind of almost got to go through that process twice. Um, so I think this was was really kind of special to be here. Uh, as you said, I also bounced around a lot, kind of looking for. I mean, I didn't get my first full time job in coaching until like my sixth or seventh year. So um, you know, just having the opportunity to be here in one place and really sort of put down my own roots and, and have my own real imprint on a program. I think that's been really special. Obviously winning the championship this year was great. That's the first time I've been able to be part of something like that as a coach. So, um, you know, to, to be able to do that in the new law, that was, that was definitely a special moment. Okay, great. So now, so now that we're talking about Franklin Pierce, let's just talk about the school located in Ringe, New Hampshire, about 2,400 students. Um, tell us about the academics. Tell us about, um, you know, the facilities. I know you, have, you play uh, in at Jason Ritchie Ice Arena. I believe you are probably the only Division I program that plays in one state, but the school is in a different state um, because uh, your arena is actually in Massachusetts. It's only about nine miles away, but the school is actually located in New Hampshire. So tell us about uh, Franklin Pierce, the school. Yeah, well, so I'm guessing that the uh, the student enrollment number that you have, that must include like grad students and yes. stuff. We got about That's 1,200. We got about 1,200 students on campus, so we are a very small school. Um, but you know, in a lot of ways, it's like one of the things that I tell kids is you kind of get the best of both worlds because you got the small, safe campus. You got all the outdoors kind of right at your fingertips. You know, on our campus, you look out the one way, you got the the lake. You look out the other way, you got the mountain. But we're also an hour from Boston, right? So so. You know, you you have opportunities to really make your experience whatever you want it to be, uh, which I think is is pretty neat. Uh, academically, I mean, we we have a lot of students that come in and, and do like biology, health science. I think those are are pretty popular majors here. Uh, but we're a liberal arts school. We've got a bunch of different majors. We got a lot of kids doing a lot of different things. Um, but you know, certainly 
I think as is true with most female athletes, they, they, they take school very, very seriously. Our team does very, very well academically, which is great for me. Um, you know, it's just one less thing that I have to worry about. I know they're going to take care of business in that regard, which is, is great. Um, being off campus, you know, again, we just, it's always the way it's always been. And, you know, we're very fortunate. We have a, a good partnership with the Winchman School and Jason Ritchie Arena and you know we've got a locker room and stuff down there so even though we're off campus it's about a 15 minute drive um you know but like I said we've got our locker room we've got our own space there it's a it's an intimate rink I guess it's it's on the smaller side but I think you look at the majority of, of women's hockey programs you get a couple hundred people at your game you're, you're doing a good job so for us to throw a couple hundred people in a rink that holds a couple hundred people, you get a certain level of energy that maybe you don't get if you, you got a couple hundred people in a rink that holds 6,000. So, um, you know, I think for us, it's definitely worked. Um, we're able to, to, to generate a certain atmosphere, a certain energy in our facility, and we've had a lot of success playing at home. Gotcha. Okay, so tell us about you getting approached uh, or you applying, I don't know how it worked, uh, to help start the program at Franklin Pierce. So this is, I'm assuming, sometime around 2011, where you started having the conversations. You got hired in October 2011 to start for the 2012 season. So tell us what that was like. <laughs> so hockey is such a small world. Um, when I had been at UMaine, uh, the second time, uh, back in 2009-10, I worked with a guy named Dan Lichterman. Uh, who, I won't get into it, but long story short, when I was in high school, he lived in Virginia and ran a rink uh, and had hired me as a high school student. <laughs> so luckily I, I wasn't too much of an idiot back then. So I'd gotten another opportunity to work with him when he was the head coach at the University of Maine. Uh, and one of his good friends uh, at the University of Maine before I had come back was a guy named Doug Tobias who worked uh, in sports information. And fast forward, I come to Maine, I'm leaving Maine, I'm looking for a new opportunity. Doug DeBias is a sports information director at Franklin Pierce University. So I think that connection, even though I didn't know him directly, uh, I think that connection may have helped me get my foot in the door to at least get an interview. Uh, and then I'd like to think I did a, a good job on the interview and, and the rest is history. But, you know, definitely, I'm sure you hear about it a lot, but those little connections in hockey and, you know, never burning bridges, and they always talk about that kind of stuff, but it does, it does come back and, and help you for sure, and it certainly has for me, uh, so I think that that may have been part of how I got my foot in the door, especially given my history, where I had pursued so many different opportunities trying to get full-time employment. Uh, I think you just look at a resume where someone's been at, you know, five or six different schools in six years, and you go, oh, like, maybe that's a red flag, but, um, you know, at least got them to sort of you know, give me a call and, and that kind of ask about that and give me an opportunity to explain, well, you know, I made zero dollars and I made twenty five hundred dollars and I made five thousand uh, dollars, you know, all kind of building up to, to getting an opportunity. So. Um, so, yeah, so that was kind of how I got the opportunity. Well, and hopefully the rest is history. Gotcha. OK, so you had almost a year to put together your team. So I'm curious if you could remember back to, 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 to when you started this. Not that old. What, what, what was your roster construction strategy to, to, to for your for your inaugural year? I, I wish I could say that you know we were we were that picky. I mean, we we wanted to get the best kids that we could, you know, but we need we need to get 25 girls. So, you know, we and I started in October and I had until the kids got to campus in August, you know, so it was a quick turnaround. So you know, I was just, I was at as many events as I possibly could be, um, you know, tier one, tier two, high school, like I, I didn't care. I went everywhere and anyone that I thought, you know, could help our team. I tried to just make contact. It was a lot of what program are you from? I've never heard of your school. Where is it? You know, uh, but just being out there and trying to make people aware that, hey, you know, we're here, we have a team. Uh, and, and, you know, we got some, some really good players that were really excited about being part of something new. And, you know, that first season, we didn't win a ton of games, but we had a, a really good core, um, you know, to, to build around. And I think you look at the sort of the quick improvement after that first year and those kids that were part of that first class, they were a huge part of it. So, um, you know, it all just kind of came together. Um, you know, it was, it was a little different. Like, I, I think we were one of the first teams kind of, you know, that year it was UNE, us, and Stevenson all kind of added, but there hadn't been a lot of expansion uh, prior to the three of us. I think since then there's been quite a bit. Yep. Um, so we were kind of early on in that process. So there might have been more fertile sort of grounds for us to pick from uh, and going out and finding players right away. Um, you know, but, uh, but yeah, it was just get out there, be as aggressive as possible and talking to as many kids as you could and, and 
you know, sell the opportunity to build something. Um, and do you remember your first win as a team? <laughs> um, honestly, like sitting here thinking about it now, I, I do, um, but not super well. I, I certainly remember our first game uh, because we lost 13 to two. Uh, and I remember just sitting there going, God, I hope every game's not going to be like this. <laughs> uh, we came out the next night, we, we played a different team, we lost in overtime, and it was like, okay, we, we, we can do this. Um, but yeah, I think, um, I think our first win was against UNE, uh, who was one of the other first-year programs. I think we beat them at their place. Um, I'm actually not 100% sure, but I think that's what it was. <laughs> All right, well, we'll, we'll, go, we'll go research it after the, the, this conversation. All right, um, so tell us about where the program fits in the conference and the division level and all that kind of stuff, because it has changed over time. Um, I know obviously now you're in new high and you're, you're playing a, a D one schedule. So um, we've had a couple of coaches, um, you know, from the new high uh, conference talk about it, but once again, maybe not everybody's heard every podcast. So maybe you could just describe, you know, where you came from to where you are today. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's complicated. So, when we started our program, we were essentially operating as a division three program, uh, but Franklin Pierce is a division two school. So we were part of a league, a uh, couple different leagues as a division three school. It was fine. We played in the regular season, um, had some success, but when it came time for the postseason as a division two school operating at the division three level, even though we were following those rules, we weren't eligible for any kind of league or national postseason. Uh, so eventually it got to a point where there were enough of us uh, kicking around that, you know, this is happening above the pay grade of the coaches, this is athletic directors and school presidents, and then saying, well, you know, there's enough of us, we can start a conference with these Division One and Two schools, Franklin Pierce, St. A's, St. Mike's, uh, we had Holy Cross at the time that we started, Sacred Heart, Post was about to start. Uh, so we had enough schools that we could start a national collegiate conference, and have a pathway to the postseason at the division one level after we go through this two-year waiting period uh which is standard for new conferences to once they've been accepted to receive an automatic bid to the NCAA tournament so this past year was actually supposed to be uh talk about bad timing supposed to be the first year uh that the winner of our conference had that automatic bid to the NCAA tournament uh but with COVID and our league not playing uh the prior season they didn't count that year so this past season ended up being our second year of that waiting period and then starting here in the upcoming season the winner of our uh, new hawk conference playoff will have that automatic bid in the NCAA tournament gotcha perfect all right thank you for for, for sharing that so you'll <laughs> guaranteed to be one of the 11 teams next year playing in in, in the playoffs hopefully someone from our league hopefully hopefully uh <laughs> yeah great and then maybe even an at-large bid if uh if there's a second team doing really well uh, in the pairwise. All right. So uh, let's talk about your actual coaching team. Um, I'm going to mess up her last name, but Julia Unterserher um, and Steve Hennessy, which is much easier. Maybe you can correct me on the <laughs> pronunciation of Julia's last name, but tell us about your, your coaching team, how you divide responsibilities um, and, and you know, how long you've been working together. So Steve is my volunteer, but he's been with me the longest. He's been with me for nine years. Uh, and he actually, so I met Steve. His wife used to be an athletic trainer at Franklin Pierce. Uh, she has since moved on, but he ended up getting a job in the admissions office. So um, he volunteers with me, uh, but, you know, he's at almost every single game in practice. Um, obviously does great work with the admission side of things. It's really nice having having somebody up there that I could call and, and get information and get answers. And, you know, when kids have questions that I don't know the answers to, that I always knew who the first call was. So, uh, so he's been, he's been a big part of our program. And again, I, you know, I wish I could pay him money, but um, I haven't been able to, but he's definitely earned it. Um, so he, he's a, he's a great friend and been a great collaborator here over the last nine years and a big part of why our team has been successful. Uh, Julia Antusayer, uh, is a graduate assistant. So she just graduated uh, this year. So I had her for the last two seasons. Um, and, you know, great job from her. Uh, another great kid, hard worker, uh, played at Lake Forest and then came here the last two years to get into coaching. So she just graduated uh, and we'll be replacing her uh, with a new graduate assistant heading into next season. Uh, but yeah, my, my staff, um, you know, my GA is the one who's with me in the office every single day. So, you know, we're we're doing everything. We're, we're, you know, we're doing everything from, from coaching and recruiting to being the equipment manager, to doing the social media, to doing video, uh, 
you know, we're, we're doing everything. Uh, it's uh, it's a, a really a two person team here in the office right now. And, and um, she works really, really hard uh, to be here with me every single day and, and do the things that we need to do to run a program successfully at this level. Sorry about that. So related to recruiting, um, what I noticed is that you have players from all over the country. So that means if you're doing most of the recruiting yourself, I'm assuming you're traveling all over the country when you're, you're, you're not in season. Yeah, I mean, yeah, my, Julia is also involved in yep. the recruiting. Um, you know, we try to get out as much as we can in the summers, uh, um, you know, a little bit here and there during the season. Obviously, it's tougher for me during the season. And it's tough to send her on the road, too, when we're playing games because, you know, I need her at the games. Um, you know, but we, we get out as much as we can. We've tried to take advantage here, especially during COVID, of, you know, there's expanded virtual opportunities, maybe more things are online. Um, so we've been able to take advantage of some of that. Um, you know, it's not ideal maybe to, uh, to watch an event on, on YouTube or, or whatever, but, you know, sometimes paying the, the $25, uh, you know, fee to be able to access it is a lot cheaper, especially now with the price of flights than paying, you know, $600 for a flight and $400 for a hotel room and $400 for a car. Um, so, you know, we've had to take advantage of those virtual opportunities too, um, you know, but yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, it is a lot of work, but it's the lifeblood of your team or the people that you bring in. So you've got to be willing to, you know, put in the time and, and we do that, you know, evaluating, communicating, you know, we try to, when kids come to campus, we try to give them the tours and do all that kind of stuff personally and, you know, put that touch on it. And, uh, but I, I'd like to believe that it pays off, you know, with the, with the people that you bring in. All right. And so the one thing I did notice on of your roster is uh, no Canadians, uh, no international. Um, you know, is, is there a bias against Canadians or um, <laughs> I'm just saying that as a, as a, as a Canadian or at least a former <laughs> Canadian? Um, or is it just, uh, it's just a matter of uh, where, where the pools are that you recruit from? Uh, there's no personal bias. Um, institutionally, our, our aid for internationals is not very strong. So... Uh, and we we certainly do not have the number of athletic scholarships that some other teams have. Um, hopefully, we'll get there someday. Obviously, we're only a couple of years into this process, so you know we're bringing things along slowly, um, which I think is the right way to do it. Uh, but you know, a lot of times I just don't have the money to make it make sense, and, and so you know we just try to we try to focus our our efforts. Um, you know, on the players that we have the highest percentage of, of chance to get. <laughs> understood, understood. Not a surprise answer. That, that's kind of what I was expecting. Um, all right, let's 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 talk about your rivalry with St. Anselm. So let's, most importantly, we had uh, Christian Matthews on the podcast as one of our first guests a little over a year ago. And we went into detail on what happened on February 22nd, 2020. Do you happen to remember what happened on that Saturday afternoon? Uh, I, I sure do. I was on the wrong end of that one, but I, I definitely remember that was, uh, that was unbelievable. I, I never in a million years thought I'd be part of something like that. And, you know, it, I guess until you're in the middle, but you don't even realize that it's happening, you know? Yeah. Um, maybe you can provide some context as to, to, yeah. yeah. You know, so, the, so the longest, longest women's hockey game, NCAA women's hockey game ever. I believe the third longest men's or women's NCAA hockey game. Uh, five overtimes, I think it was five and a half or six hours <laughs> start to finish, um, you know, so it starts out as a, as a regular game and uh, then you get into one overtime, two overtimes, the parents are throwing Gatorade bottles down over the, the bench to, <laughs> to try to get some hydration, we're eating our post-game meal between, between overtimes and then that is gone. The Gatorade machine is sold out. <laughs> okay. it, it was just, it was crazy. It was an absolutely crazy experience. And, you know, the kids on both teams, obviously, to go through something like that, you're, you know, you're playing almost, what, three games. I mean, it's two and a half games back to back. Um, that's not easy. <laughs> and so those kids worked really, really hard. And it was, it was an exciting game, you know, two to one game in, in five, five overtimes. And, I think our goalie made 79 saves or something like that. And she was unbelievable. Their goalie played so well. Obviously, you wish the result had been had been different, but um, you know, hard not to be like so proud of your team after something like that. Yeah. All right. So uh as, as disappointing as it was a couple of years ago, uh this year you your team played an exceptional season going 22 9 and 1. And uh, you happened to meet St. Anselm in the finals for the New Hot Conference. Tell us how that went. 
Um, no, it was, I mean, it was great. It was a great game. Um, I think St. A's had a great team this year. We've always had, you know, a, a great rivalry. I think, you know, the first two years that we were in existence, we didn't win any games against them. Uh, but a lot of the games were really good. They were really competitive games. And a couple of years ago, we finally broke through against them. And, um, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's always a battle. I, I think that I'm sure their kids probably probably aren't super fond of us. I know our kids get their competitive juices flowing when they know they get to play St. A's. And so to have a chance to do it for, for all the marbles at the end of the season, I know the girls were pumped up to get to do it. And, you know, having the game be on home ice, like they, they were really charged up and really excited, uh, especially when we finally did get it done at the end of the game. But it, it was a great game. I mean, it was a one nothing game. The goalies on both teams were phenomenal. Yep. Um, and, you know, it could have gone either way, but we were, we were fortunate we pulled it out. Yeah, and I was lucky that you got that early power play goal, I believe, in the first period, and uh, then you, you rode your goalie till the end of it with uh, Suzette Fauché, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was, um, I mean, I look at the last three games of our season, we had to win our last regular season game to, to host the playoffs, we won that one, one nothing. semifinals, we won 2 nothing with an empty net goal, and then uh, the final, we won one nothing. so... Obviously, team defense was a was a strength for us this year, but certainly our goaltending was phenomenal. Um, it, you, you score three goals in three games against goaltenders and, and win all three of them. I guess you don't really expect that to happen, but we were we were very fortunate, you know, not only with our goaltender but our our team defense. And uh, yeah, it was a great memory. Awesome, awesome. All right, now let, let's move on to the recruiting side of things. Um, so. Uh, First of all, tell us what it's like to recruit at, at a Newha school, um, because, um, you know, as you're still transitioning to D1, I'm sure there's a lot of education you need to do with potential recruits and then kind of trying to describe to them, uh, and especially depending on the player, like the D1 versus D3, and then kind of how Newha fits in, you know, what, what's, what's that conversation like when, when you're trying to pitch, like, here's why you should come to, you know, Franklin Pierce, as opposed to whatever other options you might be looking at? Yeah, I think that's gotten a lot easier over the last few years. I think, and there's still a little bit of who, what, where, uh, but you know that that's a lot better than it was five years ago, ten years ago. Uh, I think most people have a, a general understanding now of kind of what's going on. Um, you know, there are some kids where we have that conversation about sort of why the transformation from D three to D one happened and what the pathway was and. Um, you know, what the end product is as far as us having opportunities on the, the national level to be a part of the postseason. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, it's, it's, you're not really doing much different. It's just maybe you're talking to some different kids. Um, you know, so our process is really the same. We're still getting out and beating the bushes and, you know, trying to, to talk to as many kids as we can that we think can help our program. And then you try to get them to campus and you sell them on the opportunity they have. You sell them on the campus, you sell them on, you know, whatever it is that, uh, you know, as a coach that you believe. And, and for us, you know, our culture and, and the academics and our, our team dynamic, those things are all really important things that we try to sell the kids to. So, um, you know, just, I, I don't think it has changed much, quite honestly, for us, as far as how we go about it, just maybe, you know, now there's some scholarship money involved and, and things like that, that you didn't have before. Um, so maybe you're talking to a different pool of kids, but uh, the school hasn't changed, you know, nothing about Franklin Pierce itself has changed. We didn't move to a different city. We didn't get bigger. We didn't get smaller. So uh, in terms of that, the nuts and bolts of it, it hasn't changed too much for us. Gotcha. And I'm curious how the transfer portal has affected schools like yours, um, because, you know, now players don't have to wait out a year if they want to change. So, um, you know, I had a parent talk, tell me a couple of weekends ago at one of the um, at an event, basically saying, well, some of these teams that, you know, aren't really you know top 10 or top 20 in, in the rankings now may end up being feeder uh, programs, you know, where their best players actually move up to these higher ranked teams. But conversely, then maybe there's some players on those, you know, traditionally higher ranked teams that aren't getting as much player time, playing time, can now actually move to a program like yours and, you know, be, be a rock star. You know, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I probably not my place to get into the pros and cons of it, but we definitely have kind of experienced that. I mean, we had a grad transfer on our team this past season. Um, Kat Deja played at Dartmouth. Um, and she was, she was immense for us, not only in terms of, you know, what she could bring to the table on the ice, but I think also just her experience as a Division One hockey player, someone that played four years in the ECAC. Um, you know, my players have all kind of, you know, they've been here and sort of done this transition to the Division One level on their own, right? Like none of them had 
a situation where they got to come in and learn from players that had four years of Division One experience. So to bring somebody in who's played at that level and sort of understands, you know, what it really means to, to be a Division One athlete, what it means to train like a Division One athlete. I can sit here and tell my kids what they need to do, but to have someone that's done it for four years and, and really, you know, understands all of those things to, to kind of step in and be a leader, even though she wasn't a captain for us, it, it meant so much to our team. Uh, and we have another grad student that will be joining us this year. I'm hoping we can get a lot of those same things out of her uh, in addition to what she can bring on the ice. Uh, on the flip side of it, it is tough. I mean, for us as a, as a smaller school, uh, we don't have as many graduate options maybe as a bigger school would. Uh, so some of those kids that, you know, they get to year four, maybe they'd want to do a fifth year with us, but maybe they, maybe they study science, right? And we don't have a grad program in science that really fits what they're looking for. So, you know, it's definitely possible for schools to lose kids that maybe they don't want to lose because they just don't have the, the graduate programs to offer uh, to a, a, a kid that's looking to do a fifth year at the school that they played for four years. So I think there's a lot of different things um, kind of at play with that. And Obviously, some of that is sort of brought on by COVID, some of it maybe not, um, but, you know, there's a lot of moving parts, and I, I think there's going to be there's gonna be pros and cons for everybody, just depending on how things work out. Gotcha. Perfect. All right. So, uh, we're now, uh, you know, approaching the end of May. Um, recruiting season and the dead period ends in, in uh, a short period of time, and June 15th is a big date for 2024s. Um, and so wh where are you at with uh, kind of your recruiting strategy going into the month of June? Yeah, I mean, we're obviously we haven't been able to go out on the road or anything here for a little while. So a lot of time in the office, um, you know, we've been kind of sitting back and, you know, we've got sort of our, our board where we kind of chart out our roster over the next few years and try to see where we're at and you know, what our scholarship situation is, how much money we want to allocate to each class. Um, you know, just kind of get a, a general layout of, of where we need to allocate our resources. And then at the same time, you know, kind of evaluating where we're at for 2023, what openings do we still have? You know, what resources do we have financially to assist in filling those, those resources, uh, filling those spots? Uh, and then planning, obviously, for the class of 24 on June 15th, uh, you know, starting to figure out maybe a preliminary sort of list or ranking, I guess, if you will, of, of what kids we, we want to reach out to and hopefully initiate conversations with, uh, you know, moving into the summer. Gotcha. Okay. And, and, and what advice would you have for players who are not yet committed, either from 2023 or are going to be, become available for 2024? What advice do you have for them uh, on what they should be doing this spring and summer? Yeah, I, I mean, I think above all else, like, you, you got to be patient. Um, I, I've seen a lot of kids over the years that, you know, whether it's a friend goes through their process really quickly, or maybe a coach is pushing them or a parent's pushing them, like, kids got to remember that their process is their process. And, and you can't be swayed by what teammates are doing or what friends are doing, because what's what's important to them, what they're looking for may be a complete 180 from, from what you need and what's important to you and what your situation is. So I, I think just being patient is important. I think being open and honest with coaches is, is, is important. Um, obviously, in terms of development and playing, I mean, there's opportunities to, to go to showcases and, and and be seen and communicate with coaches and that sort of thing. But, you know, it's not something that you need to be doing every single weekend. Um, you know, everything shakes out the way it should. Um, it may not be, you know, where you're sitting there as a 13 or 14 year old and thinking this is where I want to go to school. That may not be what ends up happening, but that doesn't mean that you're not ending up at the right place. And so I think just kind of being patient, having an open mind, going through the process, um, treating it as your process and not somebody else's. Um, you know, and I think things things will things will work out the way they're supposed to. Gotcha. And um, any advice for goalies or parents of goalies who are very nervous for their kids these days? Because not a lot of opportunities for goalies these days. Yeah. No, it, it's tough. Um, you know, I think again, what are there 40, 40 Division One programs? Let's say twenty or thirty of them need a goaltender. Some schools are going to have money. Some schools are not going to have money. Everybody could have a different goalie at number one, and you could be number two on everybody's list. And if they all get their different goalie at number one, there's nowhere for you to go. So I, I understand it's a very different maybe dynamic. Uh, most schools already have three or four goaltenders. They're probably not going to carry five or six, whereas with a forward or a defenseman, if you've got eight defensemen, can you carry nine? It's probably not going to be too much of a, of, a, of a trouble to do that. So, 
Yeah, so it's very different. But again, there's there's opportunities out there for everybody, and it may not be the opportunity that you sit there and, and, and think that you're dreaming of and you think it's the right thing for you. But again, if you're patient, you have an open mind, wherever you end up, you go there with, uh, um, you know, a desire to, to make the most out of your experience. You're going to look back in four years and be thrilled uh, with what happened. That's, a, that's some great advice. All right. So um, if folks wanted to, you know, uh, you know, raise their hand and say, Hey, I want to learn more about the uh, Franklin Pierce program. Um, you know, are you putting on any camps? Are you going to be attending any events? How can folks kind of, uh, you know, connect with you guys and, and, and express an interest in learning more about the program? Yeah. Uh, I mean, obviously email is a great way. Um, you know, shoot an email, let us know where you're going to be playing those sorts of things. I mean, we do get out over the summer, uh, you know, a bunch of different events. Um, you know, obviously the bean town in, in July is a big one that's fairly local to here. So we spend a lot of time there, but we'll go out to, you know, the national camps and we'll go to, you know, different events and other places too, um, just to get out there and, and hopefully be seen and, and see players as well. Uh, but, you know, again, I, I think, you know, just com communicate via email. I think the ability to self-evaluate is super important too. you know, understand kind of where you fit in, in the realm of things. Um, you know, as a player, like watch a Division One game, watch a Newha game, watch a WCHA game, watch a Division Three game. Um, you know, have honest conversations with your coaches about where they think you fit in, and, and you know, use that as a tool to to really sort of narrow down your list as a player and, and kind of get focused on the right schools. Um, you know, otherwise, you know, as a player, you can end up wasting a lot of time. You know, sort of, you know, chasing an opportunity that maybe doesn't really exist. Um, awesome. Awesome. Okay. Well, that's, that's, some, that's some great advice. So I, 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 David, I really want to thank you for, for coming on the podcast, uh, telling us a little bit about how uh, you got into the hockey and, and specifically like your, your unique coaching uh, path and, and how you ended up at uh, Franklin Pierce. This is a pretty unique story and, and, and great to hear it. And then obviously learning about the program and, and what you've done with it. So congratulations on all your success, especially, uh, you know, coach of the year this year and obviously winning the championship. So thank you so much for doing this. Thanks, Ray. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I really want to thank David for coming on the podcast. It was great to learn more about his coaching path, the FPU hockey program, and his advice on recruiting. If you want to connect with David, you can reach out to him on the team website or via his Champs app profile. The link to both are in the show notes. Thanks for listening to today's episode. Before you go, I want to share more about the app in Champs app. If you've listened to this podcast before, you know I spend a lot of time talking with coaches, parents, and players about the hockey recruiting process. One of the key questions that people want to know is, how does a player get noticed by college coaches? While there are many ways to be discovered, the easiest way to get on a college's radar is to send a coach an email and provide them all the information they need to assess if you are a player worth keeping their eyes on. That's where the app part of Champs app comes in. Champs app was designed based on all the conversations and feedback we received about the recruiting process, and we built a tool to help players and coaches connect with a ton of the information they want to know. It all starts with creating a free, beautiful Champs app profile. After that, there are some pretty magical things that can happen to help make the recruiting process a little less overwhelming. Your Champs app profile includes all the basic academic, personal, and athletic information coaches want to know. Then, by including video, schedule information, and your coach's contact details, colleges can easily start their evaluation process. You just copy and paste your personalized link and send it to coaches so they can see your public player profile without even having to log in or create a Champs app account. Or you can connect directly with coaches on Champs app. More and more coaches are creating their own Champs app profiles and connecting with players themselves every day. Now coaches can have all the information they need to assess where you might fit in their recruiting plans. Even better, college coaches can track your progress throughout the winter and showcase seasons because as you make changes to your profile, coaches will get notified to your updates. And in the future, we will be adding even more amazing features to improve your visibility to the recruiting process and hopefully increase your odds of success. If you wanna see what a player or coach profile looks like before you start your own, look in the show notes to see some examples. My kids and I have used Champs app for their recruiting process. In fact, my son was invited to a AAA tryout thanks to his Champs app profile. So go to www.champs.app and start your player or coach profile. It only takes about 15 to 20 minutes to complete most of your key information. Good luck, and please let us know how it helped with your recruiting journey.